Hello, and welcome to another episode of Chatter, a podcast from The Gist. Today is our first episode back for 2018, and we're talking to a friend of mine, an entrepreneur, car designer, and uh, some would say visionary. We basically chat all about his ideas about the future of car design, about a couple of cars that he's designed, including one that he would like to make out of bamboo. I'll not say much more. Let's get on with the show. I've been rambling. So, Charlie, it is a pleasure to have you on as our first guest of 2018. I'm the first. You're the first one we've done this year. Yeah. Right. <laughs> first first and last. Been, first time, yeah. <laughs> well, first time you've been first in anything. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, there you go. <laughs> but no, it's, uh, I'm looking forward to, to chatting to you about your uh, many thoughts on the modern car industry and you know, how it's all going to change in the next 10 years if you have your way with it. <laughs> well, it won't be a modern car industry. See, industry is a is a wrong word, first of all, because industrialization is a really big no no now, uh, especially for a developing country. We don't want the developing world to go through the mistakes of the industrial revolution that happened in the Western world. So, no, I, I think of um, more of it as a, a different form of mobility, and obviously we're talking about electric vehicles and e mobility. But um, that's what I uh, really want to concentrate on, um, because there's there's a lots of people with some really good ideas outside of the main car manufacturing industry, and I'm not too sure if we want to make uh, electric cars or the future e-mobility vehicles the same way as we've made cars in the future, in the past, or in the I'm sorry, yeah, for for the future in the past, yeah. I think um, um, to 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 spend most of the investment or the money on building the factory to make a vehicle is is ridiculous. We should spend ninety uh, percent of the money on the actual vehicle, and probably um, uh, small manufacturing plants um, could could even be. Um, if we're really looking to the future, um, the first flat pack cars. I wouldn't mind to make. Uh, very simple uh, assembly unit for, for that, but we can come on to that later. Yeah. Well, why don't we start with uh, why metal is a poor choice for a car today compared to maybe 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago? Yes, it's strange how we've come across the, um, the, the modern car, either if it's a pressed metal or pressed aluminium. Because uh, originally uh, the, the f- first cars or the first vehicles were made on a, a, a ladder frame chassis. It was a, a chassis. In fact, the, the first cars, you, you, um, you only had a rolling chassis. You would then take it to your coach maker to make the, the bodywork. I mean, I'm talking about the very first cars. Uh, maybe something like a, a Rolls Royce. Rolls Royce just made the engine gearbox the running frame, the wheels, and then you would take it somewhere else to, to, for your coach builder to do that. And, and in many ways, these were the first platforms. Now, electric cars um, open up a, a whole myriad of, of different design solutions for the superstructure. So basically, if we, if we just had a, a structure that contained the, the batteries, and we have four wheels, and possibly motors within the wheels, not a motor, then we've got all the space free for the passengers or the cargo or whatever you like. And once you have a platform, this would be universal. You could build anything you like on top of this platform. So I believe this is the future, but it's getting the platform right. That's the important thing. So if we can then go away from um, the monocoque chassis at the moment, I mean, the, the metal or the aluminium or the steel is used to produce the uh, superstructure as well as the chassis. And all we're saying now is, well, let's uh, separate the two. Like in the past, we'll have a rolling chassis, in which case you can then build some a lightweight structure over the top. And these can be made from sustainable materials. So it's far better to grow your car. Than actually to, to, to mine the ore and then smelt the ore and then roll the, you know, the finished thing. And there's a lot of energy put into making a traditional 
a car. Whereas if you grow if you grow the material, mm. it's not any better for the environment, it's better for the people that harvest the material and so on and so forth. So there's lots of advantages, but it's not a mass production effort. Okay. It's so not an industrialized it's not an industrialized. So how do you plan to so say, okay, that this is going to be the next sort of stage in car design and car manufacturing? How do you plan to produce the car for the seven, eight, nine, ten billion people on the planet? How do you plan to produce it for that amount of people without it being an industrialized strategy? There's no production. Uh, because it's not, it's not going to happen straight away. It's like any um, disruptive technology. Uh, there is a, a limited interest. There's a limited uptake. It tends the technologies tend to be more expensive than the traditional ones. All we're saying is there's um, there's a big advantage in using sustainable materials. Uh, there's an added value that you could have by saying, well, I'm, I'm, I'm going completely green with my car. So it's no good saying, I've got an electric car, it's green. It's not if you're building in a traditional way, because the ore is dug out of the ground by diesel machines. They're, this is transported by diesel. Yeah. And uh, you know, the, the whole infrastructure is based on that. The real advantage of electric is that um, it can be the, the, the power can be uh, produced remotely. Um, there's very little losses on um, uh, uh, the electric network, about 4%. And electric vehicles are just so much more efficient. This is the really big thing about electric vehicles. Uh, whether you put uh, diesel or benzene in your car, uh, somewhere around 15 to 30% of the, the energy that's contained in the liquid fuel is used to propel the vehicle along. Now, if you look at an electric car, it's somewhere like 80 or 90 percent. So that tips the balance. That tips the balance. For me. Is it really that little, 20 or 30 percent? Yeah. That's pretty shocking. Yeah. <laughs> most people don't realize that. And, and <laughs> mo most, of, most of that, 70 percent of that, is lost in heat. Basically, what you do is, uh, you, that's why you have a radiator on your car. You, you're taking all that energy and you're producing hot water, and that's called absolutely ridiculous. No, uh, I, I think really the, 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 the thing is now is to, is to make the change from um, an expensive technology, this, this disruptive technology. There's always this, um, this uh, gulf between the, the the people who are the first uptakers and, and the, 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 the mass production. Mm -hmm. And I think this will take take some time. The whole industry has really got to change. Um, that's why we're really looking at, um, at the Asian market first, because we don't want uh, Asia to go through uh, this second industrial revolution. If we can actually build cars locally in, in small little plants uh, with sustainable materials, I think that is really in the future. So, how does this? How does it work then? If you're going to build the cars in small plants, like where are you thinking? Is there a location you have in mind for? Yeah, some, there are some really beautiful locations. Obviously, if, if we look at the uptake of electric vehicles, obviously in the Western world, we're, we're talking about countries like Norway and Sweden and Denmark and the Netherlands as as big uptakers of uh, and as a huge political incentive as well in these countries. Uh, but there is a small mountainous country in the Himalayas called Bhutan. Now they have a, a over 100% hydroelectricity, they export their hydroelectricity, but there are not so many, uh, the, the population is, is, is not too great, I think it's about 800,000 in Bhutan. Um, but uh, their philosophy is that the um, gross national happiness it's more important than gross natural product. Mm. So they have a resistance to go in to get a big manufacturer or a build factory to produce electric cars or even conventional cars. If we can if we can build a car locally from locally grown materials, and because it's a rural community, um, then I think there's a certain uh, advantage, and certainly in the, in the in the Western world, if we say, okay, you buy one of these vehicles for here in the Western world, and a certain percentage of that money will be 
going to uh, Bhutan to help their not e-mobility industry, but not not a industrialized thing. So it would, it would be possible because we don't uh, we don't have involve heavy engineering. Heavy engineering is to make engines and gearbox and driveline systems. All that disappears with electric vehicle. For sure, we have to produce batteries. But there's many places in the world that produce batteries very cheap. And most of the lithium mines are in China anyway. So I guess you would import Chinese batteries. There's nothing wrong with the Chinese batteries. <laughs> unless you, uh, unless your name, your name is Musk and you've built this factory in the Arizona desert. <laughs> Crazy amount of money. No, but um, uh, the, the, the trick with batteries is that the batteries themselves are not terribly clean. Everybody thinks, well, electric vehicles are clean, but making batteries is not clean. And it's the life of the batteries that everybody's worried about. Do I have to replace all the batteries in five or ten years' time? Well, the really key, key for this, and, and one area that we're looking at, is um, batteries like to live at temperatures where humans like to live at. They don't like the extreme cold and they don't like the extreme heat. So if you can keep them comfortable, if we keep our batteries comfortable, then the life of the battery goes up tremendously. So we're looking at phase change materials, and maybe this comes in later as well. There are certain materials that we can use, which are very lightweight, but keep batteries comfortable. So again, traditionally, if you make a normal car, normal car has uh, air conditioning, system in it. It's heavy. It uses a lot of energy. The energy can come from, again, the internal combustion engine to drive this thing along, which makes them less efficient because if you put on your air conditioning system, your efficiency of your car goes down. And we do not want to use electric power to run a conventional air conditioning system. This would be, this would be crazy. So again, these, these phase change materials are a biomaterial. Um, they're um, not um, not bad for the environment, and so we're having a look at that as well. And small, lightweight vehicles, again, we can save a lot of energy by making things lighter. Do you want to explain what a phase change material is? Uh, yeah, the, the easiest thing to think about is, um, is water. It changes, it changes its phase from uh, its solid state into its water state. So if you, you put an ice cube in your whiskey, the whiskey will stay at the constant temperature until the ice is melted, until it has changed its phase from the solid state into the liquid state. It does it again, of course, when water changes to steam or when water um, evaporates. And um, the potential of cooling from, as it changes phase is really great. It's about 500 times more than any other form of uh, refrigeration, for instance, which is again, uh, your refrigerating works on a phase change. It uses a compressor to compress a gas into a liquid and then the liquid goes into uh, uh, a gas again. And that's how your refrigerator works. But we don't want to use the uh, energy to do that. So we, we want to have a, a material that is solid and as it goes into a semi-liquid state, it absorbs a lot of energy. And then during the night, it will solidify again. So if we have a if we have a material that changes its phase around body temperature, you know, this is not a difficult thing to do now. Obviously, water is not a good thing because either it changes at zero degrees or a hundred degrees. That's not good for keeping a battery cool. But there are certain materials that now change their phase around the twenty degrees to thirty degrees. That's just perfect for cooling batteries. Okay. Well, when we back up a little bit. Um, so sort of talk about your your first uh, concept for an electric car was your seven seat SUV. Yeah, so it, was, it wasn't the first electric car I analyzed, but it was the first one that I thought, well, we should do because because uh, uh, destructive technology is expensive. So we've really got to go for the electric. I thought, first of all, we should always go for the most expensive end of the market because there's always this 1% saying, okay, I want this new technology. Always 1% of the population said, yeah, I want it because it's different, it's new. Uh, and I thought that's the only way you can do things. And so I spent two years just, just doing that. I mean, it was an expen very expensive 
seven-seater SUV for the Vietnamese market. Um, but in doing so, in having a look at all these um, different companies who, uh, who are looking at electric vehicles in a slightly different way than the mass manufacturers, um, we contact, I think there's been 350 specially small little companies doing particular parts of, uh, of electric vehicles and put it in there together. Uh, and, and in doing so, we found, well, we really don't need to go through an industrial, a large industrial uh, process um, because we're not going to sell a lot of these high-end uh, electric. We're possibly going to make 100 vehicles a year. This is not mass production. Uh, this is, and, and, uh, and, and uh, to add the quality to it, it was basically, again, like the first Rolls Royces, these are made by hand. These aren't made by a robot or a machine. These are handmade. These are hand painted. You can feel it. Yeah. You can feel, yeah, more quality than you can afford. <laughs> and I thought, well, yeah, if, if we're making things by hand, then this would also apply to small vehicles, small electric vehicles. There's no reason why you can't have something that's crap made. And especially if we were looking at uh, the, the Asian countries uh, and using sustainable materials, making things by hand, it's, it's basically basket weaving. But we'll, go, we'll, we'll come to how these things are constructed later. But it, it's, it's something that could be very easily made by hand. And um, there was uh, there was one particular uh, super example of something that was handmade. It was an aircraft made by de, de Havilland in the Second World War. It was called the Mosquito. Now, this was made from plywood and balsa wood sandwich, the same sort of construction. You make a Formula One car out of carbon fiber, uh, but this was made of wood. And uh, I think there was a famous quote by um, Hermann Goring, who was the head of the Luftwaffe then. He said, any bloody uh, Englishman who can make a piano can make one of these aircraft. Mm -hmm. And this was one of the fastest aircraft. It was a lightweight bomber, but it's faster than the Spitfire in a straight line. Because it used two Merlin engines and, and not just the one. And because it was made with wood, it had no rivets. So aerodynamically, it was extremely smooth on the, on the outside. And uh, this, this was made by unskilled workers, you know, very simple molds, concrete, concrete molds, just gluing balsa wood and plywood together. And uh, I, I'm looking at doing something very, very similar to this. Uh, instead of using plywood, uh, using bamboo. Uh, bamboo is one of these wonder materials. It, it grows a, a meter a week. Uh, you can you can crop your first bamboo after five years of uh, planting, and of course it's not a wood; it's a grass. So, but uh, and, and it's extremely strong fiber. It's um, it, it's equivalent to a glass fiber construction. If we if we put it together with bio resins, uh, we have a similar strength strength to weight ratio to glass fiber without any problems with using glass fiber. Why do you think that this is more viable than it was, say, five or even ten years ago? Like, Tesla is the potentially, or arguably, the most successful, at least in its marketing campaign anyway, the most successful and the largest electric car manufacturer in the world. It is now, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, but I think if it didn't have the investment behind it, First of all, yeah, I mean, it's like how, how do you make a small fortune out of making cars? Well, you start with a large fortune, yes, and lose half of it. Exactly. I think they made a lot of mistakes along the way, and if it wasn't for the huge, huge fortune, mm. it wouldn't be the success it was. But that, that's you can say that for every disruptive technology, you could say that about the automobile, first of all. Mm. You know, you used to have a man with a red flag walking in front of your motor car. That's, well, how you close, try that that, that's how close it came to not actually working. It was only because the horse was a major polluter of, of cities. A big It'd problem. Be awful if the other automobile did a that, big, a, big, <laughs> a big problem in New York, and which I think really uh, got the automobile industry going. But you think there was there was no there was absolutely no infrastructure for for the first cars. You had to go along to your chemist 
to buy petrol. There was no filling stations. You, know, you could buy petrol at that couple of litres a time, and, and that was it. Uh, we have an infrastructure now for electricity. Even in the developing world, 80% of the world is now electrified. Uh, and they don't have to be electrified on the grid. They can, you can have uh, micro power stations, pico power stations. You can produce your electricity from renewable sources, bio waste. So you can have small, small, uh, small power stations. Certainly, uh, you don't have to produce uh, the, the megawatts for charging your electric car. Mm -hmm. You can do it quite economically. But there is, there is a grid. There's an infrastructure the already Tesla, exists. Tesla already has this infrastructure and they're yeah. still struggling to be profitable. How are you going to avoid the, the pitfalls that they fell into without the massive capital backing? Well, because um, again, they're, they're making a conventional car. Um, and they have a, I mean, electric cars have a a certain advantage on the safety front as well. You haven't got a engine up front. Everybody thinks, oh no, I'm safer with V8 up front. No, you're not. You're safer with a, a lot of air in front of you. The crump will so. Mm. You don't want a, 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 a massive piece of metal in front of you. Um, but they had a real problem in passing their crash tests. Uh, there are certain things with an electric car, and we should get into the technicalities of it. Um, but if, if you, um, if you're driving the front wheels of a car through drive shafts from an engine and, and gearbox, it takes a lot of energy in a oblique, not the full frontal, but what is, what is normal now, the new tests are coming on, an oblique crash where something comes in at, uh, at say 30 degrees from a frontal impact. Uh, with a conventional car to tear off a wheel with drive shafts and all the couplings and everything absorbs a great deal of energy. You haven't got that in an electric car, and certainly haven't got that if you've got an electric car with wheel motors. Um, this is why you've got wheel tethers in Formula One, for instance, pieces of, uh, of Kevlar to keep the, the wheel uh, attached to the vehicle and not going off into the, into the crowd. I mean, you can do that again with electric cars, but maybe a problem with electric cars to pass the traditional crash tests. Now Tesla had a, uh, I think they had to build their own crash test facility because there wasn't enough time in the conventional uh, facilities to do all their, to their uh, crash tests. Uh, so my mind is with, um, with autonomous driving is not far away, crash avoidance is not so far away, Maybe with a lighter vehicle, we don't have to comply with these crazy crash tests. Uh, why should I add weight to a vehicle just to get past this particular test, which is, doesn't really follow what is normal for the, um, the accidents that occur as well. Um, this, this certainly a bleed test is a diff difficult to, to pass. And the uh, majority of the accidents are, I believe, not full frontal accidents anyway. Um, so I really don't need to add weight. So if I had a lightweight car, maybe that I could change direction or I could stop sooner than having two tons of mass to decelerate. And uh, this is taking the, the cue from, from motorsport. I mean, I've been working for... Uh, too long, 40, 40 years in designing lightweight motorsport vehicles from Formula One, IndyCar, Le Mans. And um, virtually unheard of now, people kidding themselves in race cars, mm. you know, that travel at 200 miles an hour, 400 kilometers an hour. Uh, these are lightweight, strong structures, and if we can do something very similar, and also what people don't realize, there's, um, there's three things that kill you in the impact. Uh, there's the initial deceleration. This is the superstructure of your car absorbing the energy, the crumple zones, for instance. And then you've got the passenger impacting with the interior of the vehicle. This is the, the why airbags have come about. But of course, in a, in a race car vehicle, you've got a full harness restraint system to stop you impacting with uh, the, the superstructure. And then, of course, you've got the internal organs, your brain or your other internal organs, impacting with your 
skeleton. Mm. And uh, basically, you want to mitigate all these three different impacts. And so you absorb the energy uh, uh, through it. But if you don't make the initial impact in the first place, we don't have the all the secondary impacts occur. Mm. So it's far better to 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 see the accident coming bef before rather than build a, a tank to 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 protect you. A tank is not not particularly good mm. uh, because then then we certainly will impact with the superstructure and our organs will impact with our skeleton. Uh, so we need a re complete rethink and and the the the, the, the initial rethink is going most sport way, lightweight structures. Uh, but yet strong. I mean, no one will say, well, a carbon fiber uh, monocoque is not, not strong. I think we can do that as well. And uh, we're also looking for, for the, um, if you like, the, the, the glazed parts, the bits that you look out from the vehicle, not from glass, but plastics as well, polycarbonates, and uh, also inflatable structures. So transparent inflatable structures, mylar is a, a good example used in the cells of the <coughs> of like really expensive America's Cup yachts and things like this, but uh, very strong material. And I think um, some of your listeners or from the blog will know the Eden Project in, in Cornwall. Mylar structure again, sort of inflatable uh, structure. So there's um, there's sort of certain advantages on using um, you know, polycarbonates or, or mylar uh, for for the glaze structures as well. It doesn't have to be glass. And I'm sure everybody that goes uh, skiing or on the beach, they've got some polycarbonate glasses with some some maybe nice coloured uh, sprayed metal finishes as well. And so these are quite good because uh, not only do they stop the ultraviolet light, but you can control the infrared light. So you've got uh, quite, a, quite a bit of control you can do with the internal climate of your car by some very lightweight, tricky, tricky materials. I think, well, just before we started, you showed me the, um, the video of Henry Ford and his hemp car hitting it with an axe. Yes, well, see, th this is again. There, there are some beautiful uh, materials that were that were used um, at the outset of uh, plastics um, that have got this bad connotation because they were related to drugs. So, so hemp is one of them, and cannabis. The two plants are completely different. I mean, when you when you when you grow <laughs> when you grow your cannabis plant at home, no, no, I'm saying I've ever grown a cannabis plant. No. It's a small little bushy type plant, mm. but the, 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 hemp, the hemp form of cannabis is long and stringy, it's about four meters tall, mm. and produces some good fibers and has a small quantity of the drug, probably about 1%. Um, but obviously when Henry Ford was doing it, and of course you can genetically engineer these plants as well, you can either add the drug to the plant or take the, the drug away from the plant completely. Um, so yes, um, I kind of think the, uh, the the politics got in for, uh, involved with uh, Henry Ford. Um, he, he was, um, I think, he was using hemp and a bio resin. He was also making the fuel for the car from from the hemp seed as well, which you can make. And you can use it for lots of things. You can use it for cosmetic products. You can use it as a, a form of uh, animal feed. Um, it's uh, a lot more disease resistant than producing uh, than growing cotton. So there are certain advantages. And um, yes, he did a famous car in the uh, 1940s, made from made from hemp and, and resin. Uh, I think you can see on YouTube there's a there's a YouTube video of him hitting it with a, a sledgehammer, mm -hmm. and not making a dent, not making a dent in the, in the thing. So for sure. So would that help to pass those sort of crash tests, or like no. how, how 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 strong is it? It, it, it it's lightweight, it's strong, and it, it allows you to uh, make a superstructure any way you like. If we have, um, if you if you can imagine it, um, a skateboard with four electric wheels, on it, then you could make the top of the vehicle anything anything you want. So it could be your SUV, it could be a saloon, it could be a uh, 
pickup truck, it could be a tractor, it could be any anything you want because the the drive system is all in in the in the skateboard. The back the skateboard uh, contains all the batteries. Uh, we have uh, motors in the wheels, so we have. Um, uh, no transmission uh, system at all, physically no engine and no gearbox. Uh, this is a nice thing about electric motors, they have torque from standstill. Uh, and uh, at the moment, the technology is advancing very, very quickly. A lot of people say to me, uh, yeah, the, the problem is uh, putting, putting weight in the wheels. So you've got this sprung to unsprung weight ratio. You know, the weight of the wheel should not be more than, say, one sixth the weight of the, 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 the chassis and the passengers. Should be a ratio of around six to one, and that's nice and comfortable. Well, a Formula One car has a really terrible ratio. It's about four to one, and no one tells me that the eggs don't handle too well. And you could make them quite comfortable as well. It's the type of suspension system you put on. Now, I've been working on, on a suspension system that is ideal for electric cars uh, from, the, from about, oh, I don't know, 35 years now. It was banned in motorsport as being too good. And it's been recently banned, I think, in 2015 in Formula One because it was, again, classed as too good and also controlling the aerodynamic platform, which is illegal under the rules. But no one says you couldn't put this into a an electric car. It's a, it, it comes under the terminology of an interconnected suspension system. There are a few notable examples. Um, the 2CB, the Chauveau from Citroën had a mechanical system of interconnection. The first Mini had a hydraulic interconnected system. But the latest ones connect all four wheels together in a completely different way. So we have complete control of the vehicle dynamics and the comfort of the car. So if you're making a very small, lightweight car that tends to be pitch and roll sensitive, you, know, you can't really make it really comfortable mm -hmm. and still have it you know, be able to handle correctly. But we, we can do that. Um, there's, uh, there's some beautiful co companies now making internet uh, suspension systems, and uh, they don't have to be terribly expensive. I can't go. I can't go into much. If, if I tell you much, too much about it, I have to shoot. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, well, you, can't, uh, you can't go around shooting everyone that listens. No, to you, you can't well, you can try. Well, this will be. I mean, people can people look up interconnected sus suspension system. So, how did you arrive at bamboo from from deciding that from from the from deciding that okay, we're going to try. You wanted to go high end in the electric car market to them, thinking, okay, we're well, going to go the complete opposite. Yes. We're going to turn everything on its head and we're going to go and build a bamboo, well, we're going to try and go and build a bamboo car that costs, I think the price you sort of said was around £3,000. Well, there's a high end, there's a high end project, product and it's a fishing rod. Now, I don't know that. I, I don't go fishing, but I've, I've heard from when I was very young, I went fishing with some people who really know about uh, angling or fishing, that especially fly fishing, they use a thing called split cane. And I, I didn't know what split cane was. Um, and I thought, well, um, why are these top fishermen not going to uh, uh, um, carbon fiber instead of using bamboo? This split cane was actually made from, from bits of bamboo. And um, it's called split because they split the bamboo into different segments and they put them together like a um, triangular hexagon part, six parts that made a, a hexagon shape. And these are still classed as some of the best fishing rods because they're lightweight, but they also have the, because they're using bamboo, it has a certain amount of damping in the system as well because when you when you flex a material uh, it's got to be like a spring but it's also got to be a bit like a damper and bamboo does these two things it's lightweight it acts like a spring when you want it you uh, act like a spring and it acts like a a, a damper to absorb uh, energy when you want it to uh, act as a damper and i thought well okay if if carbon fiber is not better than bamboo in this just one specialist thing. And 
uh, you don't have to do too much lateral thinking away from a fishing rod to a car suspension system because we want it to flex like the fishing rod flexes but we also want it to dampen the energy so if I make some of these um, suspension components a bit like a Formula One car some wishbones you know a triangular structure top and bottom that holds another component that holds the wheel in place that uh, we could have something that would act like a spring but also act like a damper and we can add also some extra damping with um, another uh, intelligent material uh, it's called a non-newtonian polymer and this is a polymer that acts uh, not like a, a, a normal materials would, would uh, operate this is when when you actually uh, deflect this polymer it has an extra resistance to it. So the more you, the, the greater energy you put into it, the more energy it can absorb. So if we make a composite material from bamboo and and these polymers, really we have a suspension system that has is very light, has no moving parts, it absorbs the energy when you want it to absorb the energy, and it flexes like a spring when you want it to flex like a spring. But it's combining these two together. And additionally to that, then we have our interconnecting. So we have a, a way of interconnecting all four wheels together. Now, the beauty of this is with, um, if you have, um, a thing with four legs, a table or a chair, if one of the legs is shorter than the others, it starts to rock. It's not stable. You have a very stable, uh, form of uh, seating arrangement called a stool, a milking stool with three legs, for instance. But cars have four wheels, generally. There have been vehicles with three wheels, but four wheels it seems to be the norm, and it actually gives more space to the passengers having a wheel in each corner. Uh, but keeping those four wheels in contact with the ground at all times means you need a suspension system. And even if you've got a suspension system on uneven ground, two of the wheels will have more load on them than the opposite two, or diagonally opposite two. But with an interconnected suspension system, we have equal weight on all four wheels all of the time, regardless of the terrain. Now, of course, this is why it was banned in motorsport, because the first time I used it was in 1985 on the New Zealand rally, which was a very fast off-road rally. And uh, the drivers liked their cars set up very stiff for, for the, pass, uh, the fast sections, but they wanted them very soft for the twisty bits or where you were really off road. Mm -hmm. And uh, they asked me and said, well, Charlie, can you come up with an idea that I can disconnect the roll bars on the car as you go in the lot? Mm -hmm. And I said, well, you, you're not going to be able to do this fast enough to, to do it. And they said, well, can you come up with an automatic system that does it for us? Well, well no, I can't can't really think of one. And then I went away and there was an Australian working for another team as well that went away and we both came up with a very similar system. He went on to make a lot of money from his system. I think he, he, he sold it to Monroe or Tenneco or something mm -hmm. for millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. And now he's making tables that don't rock. Mm -hmm. You can look him up on the internet. It's called no, no, the No Rock Table. I think. <laughs> But it's based on the same principle. Mm -hmm. And there's no reason that you, you can't use this principle either hydraulically or mechanically or uh, don't have to do it electronically. This is not an active system. It works completely passive, independent of you. And so it will keep the equal load on all four contact patches. Uh, McLaren are famously using the Tenneco Monroe system, which was which was his original invention. But there are a few others uh, doing it as well. And this would be great in, in the developing world where maybe only 10% of the roads are tarmacked. Uh, if you've got electric, if you've got electric wheels and you want to recover uh, uh, as much energy as you can, you want the tire to be in contact with the road surface. So with this suspension system, one is extremely lightweight and it does what it says on the, on the can. It, uh, it makes the vehicles fundamentally a lot safer. Uh, you can use the potential of electric wheel motors to the full. And it also allows us to do some very, very tricky things with um, accent avoiders.
this as well because we are not connected with uh, drive shafts and differentials and gearboxes. We can control the speed of the wheels individually, the torque that goes to the wheels individually, and now we're also controlling the vertical force on the thing. So you're, you're controlling these three major things that, that, that then have uh, complete control over the, over the vehicle. Um, there's a good example of, of this is um, there's, if you like, the three golden rules of aerodynamics. You've got control, stability, and then handling. Now, control and stability are like two sides of uh, with the same coin. Things that are very stable tend to be difficult to control. And things that are easy to control are not very stable. A bicycle is a good example. Okay. A bicycle, intrinsically, is not terribly stable. We have to have that, you know, to, I know when I was three years old trying to learn to ride a bicycle, I thought this thing was trying to kill me until I, until I had to have a certain amount of control. Um, the first aeroplane was very similar. They were, this, this thing was built by uh, bicycle manufacturers. And if you have a look at the, 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 the photographs of this thing, it didn't have dihedral wings. It didn't have the wings that go up from the fuselage. Mm. It, had, it went in the other way because they thought controlling the aircraft was the key. So they made the aircraft inherently unstable, but they could, with a bit of skill, they could start controlling it like a bicycle. And now on modern, if you fly modern planes and everything else, they've got wings that go up from the, the fuse like to make them intrinsically stable, but more difficult to control. Fighter aircrafts, of course, have the wings go in the other direction. So we're, we're going to do something like this. So if we've now can control, if we, if, the stability and, the, and, and the, the control are not opposites anymore. There are, we have complete control of them and we, we can do what we want. And then we can control the handling of the vehicle. And when we can control the handling of the vehicle, then maybe we can come on to vehicles that can drive themselves. This, this is the thing, because basically you've got to start with a good foundation, first of all. It's a fallacy thinking that you can control a vehicle by by clever electronics when the vehicle is intrinsically unstable. Now start with a start with a vehicle that is stable that you control and is lightweight, and then maybe we can have a robot drive. So, given that, I think the the phrase that you used in the presentation you sent me was um, it's a combination of environmental, social, and economic reasons in order to pushed you towards the concept you're at now and sort of helps to justify it in terms of selling it to potential investors or to, to the world in general as a, as a great idea. So given that you want to cut out factories, you want to build the car locally with sustainable abundant materials mm. that will produce very little pollution. The car itself produces very little pollution aside from mining the lithium that's required for the batteries. And especially if you're building and running it in countries where there's a high to total uh, domination of renewable energy sources in the country. And you're hoping to make it low cost and easily available to almost anyone and easy to drive off road. Why has no one thought of this before? It's a really good question. Um, and that's why we've gone to Bhutan, you see, first of all. Uh, first of all, there's the, um, the politics of Bhutan is, um, you know, the gross national happiness is, uh, um, has more weight than the gross national uh, productivity. Uh, it has the hydropower, has the infrastructure. Uh, it's a rural community. Uh, has all the materials on hand. Maybe it doesn't have the balsa, but it certainly has the bamboo. It has enough bamboo. Uh, balsa could uh, could be grown uh, locally as well. Uh, but we're a world economy. There's no reason why uh, bamboo can bamboo has been exported to to the Western world and the other way around. Um, they're starting to grow bamboo in Central America at the moment. But Bhutan is a is a is a really uh, really good example. 
Um, they do have a lot of hydroelectricity. Uh, um, at, at the moment, they're controlling their tourist industry. There's a, there's a $200 or around $200 levy if you want to, to visit Bhutan. Um, they don't, they have, uh, I think, about 800,000 inhabitants, maybe half of those are our driving age. Uh, they import diesel and benzene, but the money that it could save by not importing diesel and benzene, uh, the king of Bhutan could produce an electric car built locally for all his inhabitants at no cost. Plus, you can run the vehicle for free for all of its life on the, on the amount of hydroelectricity they have. And uh, this I think uh, in a in a country in the middle of nowhere in in the mountains in Asia can do this. Then maybe the Western world could rethink the way that they produce cars as well. Maybe there'll be a, an upsurge of uh, small motor manufacturers, not just the big players that are making specialist vehicles and uh, out of sustainable materials. Uh, done in, the, in a completely different way because you think you don't need the heavy industry uh, technology. We don't need to make um, we don't need to make engines. We don't need to make gearboxes. Making electric motors are very simple, simple things. And there's lots of specialist uh, companies, especially in, in Europe and, and America, making really super in-wheel motors now. Of course, you know if you've got an electric bike, it's got an in-wheel electric motor on it. It's not a it's not too far to take it away from your bicycle to um, to maybe a, a slightly larger motor, and they don't have to have a lot of power. Possibly only 10 kilowatts per wheel, and if it's uh, four wheel drive, that's 40 kilowatts. That's enough. Mm. Well, certainly enough to carry Charlie along somewhere mm. at a reasonable speed as well. I'd say so. Yeah. So I I kind of think that uh, if if a, a small country like Bhutan can do it, we'll set uh, set the rest of the world alight. Well, if they can do it, we can all do it. And uh, and uh, we haven't got any problem with the politics there, mm. because it would be the uh, why should a a country um, that has the 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 highest uh, percentage of electric vehicles per capita uh, want to go to a foreign motor manufacturer and import a car that's made in the traditional way when they could do it themselves. Mm. Um, and, and if we're if we're talking about the materials that we wanted to use, that they can be made uh, very much on a, on a local uh, thing. The, the whole community could come together to put together, if you like, their kit car. So there would only be a certain number of components that we'd have to produce off-site, and these could be 3D printed, for instance. There's uh, reinforced plastics now, and uh, we've already prototyped a few vehicles with uh, some 3D printed uh, suspension components. The main chassis would be made of uh, a composite, a sandwich, basically like the same as you would make a race car. Uh, we have uh, bamboo, um, panels on the outside uh, and balsa on the inside. Um, so extremely strong, uh, lightweight, and can be made uh, by anyone that has a small amount of craft knowledge. And certainly, if you're a carpenter, you could put one of these things together. Mm. So looking forwards, you talked about how cars used to be designed in that someone would make the chassis. And then you'd go to your coach builder to have the rest. Mm -hmm. Do you see that as as a as a, a, like a way that things could go in the future? Because we've got the sort of very early glimpses of the phones that could be assembled themselves, like a kit phone almost, like yes. it was made from building blocks, and you sort of assemble it yourself. Do you think that it's possible that we could end up with cars that are like that? Do you think the big manufacturers would allow that? In these, like, sort of no, I think they have too terms. much. They, they have too much money invested on the conventional things. Um, big manufacturers are making le electric cars because it allows them to make more of the conventional ones. Mm. It's a big, big trade-off you know, when you've got some exclusive car manufacturers. Um, I don't know what we 
mentioning names, but also making small electric cars so they can carry on making their V8s. So this is a little bit, it's a bit crazy. What sort of car manufacturer would do that? Uh, Bentley, for instance. <laughs> Now, would you would you buy a Bentley small electric car? Maybe because it's got a Bentley badge on mm -hmm. the front, but no. If you can have a Bentley, you want the pool. There are a lot of uh, small startup companies making really uh, nice electric cars. Uh, one of them in Sweden, which I like very much. I want to see. Uh, the opening of it, and um, and again, they're doing the whole the whole, whole infrastructure correctly, and because uh, if you're if you're making a small electric car, you have no showrooms. You, know, you don't want to put in the infrastructure. You know where where do you go? Where it's like the it's like the smart. You know, they have to go to Mercedes or use the Mercedes money because we don't want to build showrooms for ourselves. Uh, and they're using Media Mart. I think, well, what a what a super way because you've got all these techno buffs going to Media Mart for their phones and everything else. Why not? Why not touch step it up for the electric car? Maybe they made a little bit of a mistake making it as a conventional car. They should have gone. Uh, they should have gone the whole way. But they've got some young minds, some really interesting things. Uh, I hope it works for them. But I think there'll be lots of there's be lots of these small startups, and um, and maybe uh, they might want to use one of our universal platforms as well, made of sustainable materials. You can do what you like on them. Uh, I can I can see these uh, very simple kits. I can see that you you could not have something that or you know, won't be a flat pack car revolution, but it would be very close to that. I can't see that it's too far away. That you could not assemble one of these yourself. Kit parts would arrive and glue it together. Yeah. It'd come with a screwdriver and Allen key, mm -hmm. and someone else would put it together, which would be too difficult. The only the only reservation I would have is do I want to be on the road besides some genius who assembled their own car very poorly? Well, you see, there's a, um, in the in the rest of Europe, traditionally in the UK, you could build anything you want. You had to go and take it from. Um, but it, um, generally, the people that are taking the time to assemble one of these uh, things themselves, uh, kit car industry has got a bad name. I, I would say, well, you know, you're 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 making something quite exclusive for yourself. Um, you can get your bicycle come into a cardboard box and just put it together yourself. It wouldn't be too it wouldn't be too far removed from that. All all the uh, all the tricky components will already be there in the, the, the electronics and the batteries and the mass avoidance and all this sort of thing would already be sorted out. It's just a straightforward piece of assembly. And if you've got a set of assembly instructions that go wrong, um Lotus 7, for instance, is probably a good example of a high-end performance car. And most of the people who put one of these things together were enthusiasts and uh, are, are, you know, it's quite a, quite a safe vehicle. It's still, still sort of. So I can't see the revolution is going to be too far away from that. Um, again, the, the, it will start, it will start small and, and grow. And I quite like the idea of it staying small. Uh, and, and not being uh, not being produced in in, in the millions in, in big factories, I kind of kind of like like that idea. Whereas uh, you can you can customize it. Uh, you know, you have the vehicle that is particularly for you. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be driving around in the same vehicle as everybody else. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess we're at a point where things are becoming increasingly more. Personalized from being incredibly uniform, we're starting to see because of 3D printing and the ability to get things printed on, you know, for, for example, people can get anything printed on a film case or, uh, or anything like that is the first thing that comes to mind. But it's very easy to get that sort of thing customized now at very little cost. So I guess it's only a matter of time before the same thing happens to the auto, I don't want to say industry, after your whole lecture about well, it's not going to be an industry, but... <laughs> <laughs>
Well, yes, even conventional cars have changed a lot. It used to be, there used to be a seven year lead time from the initial concept sketches until the, the final vehicle. And now there's motor companies producing three, three different models in a year. Um, and, and I think that that's because the whole thing is changing, it's changing so fast. I kind of like the idea of a universal platform that you can change the upper body styling as, as you like, uh, as fashion might dictate, if you like. Or even as, as your, uh, as your, uh, socially, as it, as it changes, maybe you want a sports car when you're young and maybe then you have a little family or, okay, I want a, I want a baby carrier in there or I want a, you know, I want my, uh, I want my uh, shopping runabout or something like this. Uh, wh why not? Mm. Why not have something that you can change when you go away on holiday, mm. as opposed to uh, your commuter vehicle? Uh, I see no, I see no problem with um, doing that. And uh, yeah, with three D printing, you can you can do a you can do a lot to to change the the styling of the vehicle, the way the vehicle looks. Any last thoughts you want to leave us with? Wrap up here. Um, yeah, no, that is a good question as well. I think, I, I think, um, yes. Be curious. Mm. Keep an open mind. Uh, don't be, uh, don't be influenced with the misconceptions of the, of the past. I kind of think that's the that's the way. I mean, I, personally, I'm 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 one of the uh, the oldest. People with a mind of a ten-year-old uh, around, at the moment. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I always used to watch a, 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 a program on um, on TV. It was a puppet program called Thunderbirds. These were things you know, mm. on on strings, and it was called I, I believe it was called uh, International Rescue. It was, and they had these weird and wonderful machines. Thunderbirds one through when, five. Yeah, <laughs> I thought, well, when I grow up. Those are the things I want to design. <laughs> These are the things I want. And I remember there was a pink uh, Rolls Royce, had six wheels. Yeah. And, uh, I thought, uh, Lady Penelope's. Lady Penelope's Rolls Royce. I thought, yeah, that's good. That's a good idea. Six wheels. I thought, that's good. That's a good idea. <laughs> I think, well, I'll do a six wheel. I think I want to do a six wheel car. And uh, yeah. And I kind of think uh, I've never I never lost that as I've grown older. I still want to design things, and the only way I could do that is obviously go into into motorsport and design weird and wonderful things. Um, but they performed, you know, they had to perform, and uh, we had to produce a new vehicle every year. So this this motorsport industry, when you you have an idea today. Get the materials tomorrow, and you're out racing them at the weekend. This is how the, the electric car industry may well go. Mm. It's got to be that quick. It's got to be changing very fast, and you can't get uh, you can't get stuck in the old ways of doing things. I, I, I'd love to work with uh, young people today. Have some brilliant ideas, and we can actually go and go and make it and put a prototype together in a few months and be out driving. Mm. It's funny how in a um, Era where things are being like, for example, software on your phone or your computer or or anything, or your your version of iTunes is getting updated monthly, practically, and car the the car industry is going almost the opposite way with different um, vehicles being offering lifetime warranty and, and seven years warranty, and you know the cars are being designed to last as long as possible. You know, in an era where everything else is is moving much faster, is changing. Yes, there's so I can I can see that now that the vehicle should change just as quickly as the software update, and we're not too far away from from the vehicles talking to each other as well. Mm. So when they're parked up, so you know the, the vehicles will change their experiences. <laughs> so um, and this 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 is frightening in in some ways because this is all fuzzy logic. How do we know what uh, what they're doing? Um, there was a there was a uh, an example with a smart car. I was one of the first uptakers. Well, I wasn't. It was my girlfriend was the first uptaker of a smart car. And I, I kind of like, I did like the I did like the car, but she wanted just a city runabout. And uh, we live in Austria, of course. We bought it in the summer, 
and uh, and then the first snow arrived. Well, it was raining first, and then there was a little it got colder during the night, and there was there was a few centimeters of of new snow on top of a quite a a, a slippery under surface. And they said to me, um, "Oh, Charlie, get get the car out of it." You know, parking spot turning around for me because we were on a hill. Uh, um, and, and then I can drive it to work. I said, well, look, don't be stupid. It's a little bit. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's not really, it's not really difficult. She said, no, no, okay. Uh, I'm just gonna, and I thought, okay, I'll, I'll just take you out in the driving spot. So I, I was just heading off downhill to the bottom of the hill to turn it around and come back up again. And I just pulled out and I was only going a few kilometers an hour and, and I, I just lightly touched the brake pedal. Now the, the ABS thought, oh no, what we should do is uh, lock up the wheels momentarily uh, and then release the brake pedal again. So taking take uh, the initiative away from the driver. So that's what I did, the front wheels locked up. Of course it's a very light car and it had small little tires at the front. Front wheels locked up and it formed a little mound of snow in front of the tire. And then the, 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 the brake system decided, no, what well, we shouldn't be locked up, we should start rolling. So it rolled over this hump of snow in front of the tires, it sort of leapfrogged in the air, and then it locked up again as it landed. <laughs> so the next time was a, a slightly larger lump of snow that went on. So this car started to bounce up and down on its front suspension, it was uh, leapfrogging up in the air. And there was Ingrid you know, saying, hey, Charlie, don't mess about, you know. <laughs> I was nervous enough as it was. You know? I said, well, I'm not doing anything, you know. So I was modulating with the brake pedal, you know, I was trying, I was trying everything. You know, I was standing on the brake real hard and I was doing, this, but the, the brake system had taken over, you know, and uh, I was picking up speed. So this thing was going faster and faster down the mountain, uh, jumping up and down even more. And it was only 50 meters before the edge of the mountain. So I was thinking, what should I do? So I to drive it into a tree or, or try, to try to do a swerve or, or something. And, and, and I thought, no, it was a narrow, narrow road. And I thought, oh, I've just let go of everything in the end, took my foot off the brake pedal and pulled on the handbrake. It's the only thing I could think about. It took me all of the 50 meters to slide to a stop. And then I thought, well, I'm not the only person. I, mean, I know how to drive cars. I know about vehicle dynamics. I know what the braking system should do. And this car was doing something that was really dangerous. So I, I wrote a letter to Mr. Smart. I said, dear Mr. Smart, <laughs> your car is trying to kill me. <laughs> what are you going to do about it? And I never got a reply, of course. Well, and then I did a full vehicle dynamics exercise. I analyzed what the brake system, what brake system we put on the car, what type of tires they use, whether it would work in all these sort of conditions. And I thought, well, there's really a big dynamic imbalance. So I said, well, dear Mr. This is my second. Uh, dear Mr. Smart, your, your car is still trying to kill me. But I believe if you do this, this, and this, and this, it will put it right. If you don't do any of this, and it does either injure me or my girlfriend in a bad way, I'm going to sue the ass off of you. Of course, I didn't get a reply no. to the second letter. Uh, so... Um, uh, but I did get a telephone call from the, the workplace and they said, well, we've got a new bit of software that we're going to put on for the braking system. I said, oh, okay, okay. So we took it down and sort of put this thing and I thought, well, okay, well, next bit of snow we get, we'll, we'll, we'll try it out and see if it's good. Um, it, it helped in certain situations and in the others it, it really didn't help at all. And so my third letter to them, I said, well, you know, I'm, I'm getting paranoid. Now, dear Mr. Smart, I'm getting paranoid. Sometimes your car is only wanting to kill me. Other times it's quite friendly. <laughs> <laughs> How do I know when it's one way or the other? Hmm. Yeah. Uh, eventually, they did put bigger tires on the front of the car. And I think they rearranged the braking system. They had a bit of traction control to it. And we, we never we never did get the last update. We sold the damn thing and bought another car. Uh, but it's it's a good show in that uh, you cannot second guess what the environment or the driver is going to do. There's no bits of electronics that, uh, to in my mind, is clever enough now to be able to cover all situations. You have to start with something that's intrinsically safe. 
And maybe then, with electronics in their infancy, we can slowly go to autonomous vehicles. But to make bad cars and to sort it out with a piece of electronics, to my mind, is better. Um, there was a, another example in Mercedes A class. Uh, Saab had come up with this uh, test called the elk test after one of their managing directors was killed by driving into uh, an elk. So they decided what would be better is not to have a collision with a heavyweight animal, but to actually drive around it, swerve around it. And this is this double lane change test. Well, they took the first Mercedes A class through this one, it landed on its roof. <laughs> they took a Trabant which was from East Germany, uh, which was uh, a laugh at because it was also had sustainable materials. Most of the plastic in interior was made of cardboard. <laughs> but this went through the out test perfectly okay without landing on its roof. And all the press were there. And of course, uh, it had to uh, be removed from the Dutch line. It was intrinsically unstable. And not many people know this, but this was the start of electronic control. Bosch said, ah, we were developing a system that could probably stop it handing on its roof. And they would say, how much does this cost? Well, 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 we want it, we'll buy it off. And this was the whole start of the stupid industry. But it would be far better not to start with the same thing. Try to fix it electronically. Not better to start with the Trabant. So that seems like a great place to leave it there. Thanks very much for doing this. It's been uh, educational. I don't know. I've not been rambling on for hours already. <laughs> Thanks very much for listening. Don't forget to follow us on Facebook and Twitter, or subscribe to us on Apple, on Podbean, wherever you get your podcasts. Until next time, thanks for listening.